Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeff Klein. I'm a professor of practice in the Military Operations Research Department and a member of the Naval uh, Warfare Studies Institute, which sponsors our Sea Power Conversation uh, series of discussions, both at the unclassified and classified levels on issues related and important to uh, the Naval Service. Today we're going to address a very interesting topic uh, which was at great applicability during the Cold War and may have to be resurrected again. Uh, this particular author, Paul uh, Giaro, is definitely in his article uh, in Proceedings last month, uh, Tatar Nuclear Weapons Again at Sea. I think this is a highly interdisciplinary topic, everything from physics to national security affairs to game theory uh, to simulation. Uh, which might uh, need to be addressed in this topic. And so we hope this discussion will start a series of conversations and make out, uh, kick off a series of research topics and discussions for both our scholars and our officers here at the Naval Postgraduate School. I'd like to introduce uh, Paul first, read a little bit about his background, turn the podium over to him for, to, for about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A both online and in the room. Our moderator for that Q&A will be Dr. Jim Wirtz from the National Security Affairs Department. Uh, Paul has a distinguished career as a naval officer. Uh, he was a strategist and a distinguished author as well. He's the president of Global Strategies and Transformation. This is a professional service firm and strategic planning consultancy. During his Navy career, he was a P-3 pilot, a designated naval strategic planner, and a political military strategic planner for the Far East, South Asia, and Pacific issues. He also managed the U.S.-Japan Alliance in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And in this discussion, he'll be specifically addressing this recent proceedings article that I just raised, Time to Recalibrate. The Navy needs tactical nuclear weapons again. And with that, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Can you guys hear me? We're wondering if this works. It's OK? OK, good. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not used to having big audiences, so we'll see how this goes. Um, first, I want to give you a little bit of inside baseball about this article. And, and I am here to recruit you. So. Um, this article is part of the American Sea Power Project series in the U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings magazine. And uh, I hope that at least you are members of the Naval Institute and read proceedings. Um, the, the genesis of the article is really the genesis of the project. The, the stipulation and the premise for the project of the American Sea Power Project is that the bottom has fallen out of American public and political and naval uh, community appreciation for what the U.S. Navy is, is all about, what it's supposed to be doing, where it's supposed to be doing it, with whom, and so on. Uh, that may seem a little ironic, but I think it's exactly right. So uh, we had a brown bag here in this room all about the maritime strategy, and the maritime strategy is sort of the incarnation of what the Navy should be doing. But in any case, the, the format for the American Sea Power Project is the ends, ways, and means of American naval power. American sea power, really, but we li we've limited ourselves and will limit ourselves through the duration of the project to naval power. And the, that's how the project is organized in three phases. The ends, what is the U.S. Navy for? Uh, the, the ways, how would you use the U.S. Navy? And we're now in phase two, so we're in that how would you use the Navy ways phase. And then the third phase, for which I want to recruit you, is means. Now, that does not equate with widgets or programs or platforms or systems it's where are we how are we doing and if we're doing well then maybe some of the pressure is off if we're not doing well which is my conclusion then what do we have to do to, to catch up keep up and make up lost ground in this era of great power competition so Nuclear weapons pretty much should only come into play at times of great power competition. 
And that's what, that's what the whole issue was about the first time around, right? The first time around being the war with Germany and Japan. If the Germans get the atomic bomb before we do, what's going to happen? I did not plan for the Oppenheimer movie to come out when I wrote this article. Uh, contrary to, com to common uh, belief, they didn't make the movie because of my article, I must, I must confess. But the Oppenheimer movie does a pretty good job of capturing the, the heartaches and the difficulties and the technical challenges, but also the moral challenges of nuclear weapons. I completely want to associate myself with those difficulties and um, those problems, because after all, nuclear weapons are nothing if they're not problematic. But then the second context of nuclear weapons was the Cold War with the Soviets. And then we had a tremendous buildup on both sides, both in strategic weapons and then in tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, we have a German officer in the, in the audience. There were something like 5,000 impact points on German battlefields of tactical nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Uh, those were planned impact points if we had to go to war with the Soviets. Um, the third context now is in the post-Cold War world where we have basically unilaterally withdrawn all but a few, maybe about a hundred or so, uh, tactical nuclear weapons from around the world. Uh, we've withdrawn from Northeast Asia uh, ashore and from the Navy afloat worldwide. Um, that was then, and this is now. And so in part, in part uh, what was going on was, well, we can afford to do this. Great power competition is over. It's, after all, the end of history, right? You've heard that. That was one of the greatest uh, strategic blunders of all time was for right mi otherwise right-minded people here and elsewhere around the world to think that all that stuff was behind us. And of course, now we're back. So when Vladimir Putin started rattling his nuclear saber, it occurred to me in the context of the American Sea Power Project, well, we need to have tactical nuclear weapons, I, I say tactical nuclear weapons, as an issue in the project and as the subject of one of the articles. And so, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So I said, okay, and I went through the recruiting of a wonderful academic author. He wrote a draft article, and then all that fell apart. And so now we were looking at this situation, and if we were going to have this article as part of the American Sea Power Project, I was going to write it. <laughs> I didn't expect to have to write it, but I did. So what you see is the end result of that kind of catch-up, pick-me-up effort. One of the main premises of the article, and I hope it comes through, is that the whole idea of non-proliferation and counter-proliferation is simply not working. There's nuclear pro proliferation all over the place. It's in the context of that, that our allies, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, are wondering, okay, all these countries are coming up with tactical nuclear weapons. Where are your tactical nuclear weapons? So we'll get to that here in a minute. So the idea is we, to shift from arms control and non-proliferation and counter-proliferation to firepower in great power competition. So in 1993 or so, I think it's 93, President George H.W. Bush decided to withdraw tactical nuclear weapons and the rest, as they say, is history. And the next sound you heard, and this is a big issue, this is a big deal presently, was the door slamming on Navy tactical nuclear weapons. They were withdrawn from ships and squadrons and submarines and then the Navy proceeded to make it so that we couldn't bring them back if we wanted to. 
They were very, very unpopular. In this, at the same time, in 1994, uh, the international community um, put together what's called the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed that Ukraine, the same Ukraine as today, if, if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons that were left from the Cold War, that had been Soviet nuclear weapons, that Russia, now Russia, not the Soviet Union, Great Britain and the United States would vouchsafe for Ukrainian security. There's a problem with that though, because as the world turned and as we went on and as history continued, apparently we forgot that, but the Ukrainians haven't forgotten and nor have other allies. So um, we forgot. And then a series of DOD reports in my view, and I have no way of of proving this, except subsequent analysis by others has pretty much put the lie to estimates of Chinese nuclear weapons. Now, I think you know, if you don't, you should know that the Chinese are in the midst of a, a nuclear breakout. The Chinese are um, fielding long range uh, ballistic and cruise missiles with nuclear capability, dual use capability and they are building strategic nuclear weapons uh, silo fields in Chinese deserts. So that's going on. My sense is that the long-standing estimate of 300 Chinese nuclear weapons was just not right. If you pay any attention to uh, Professor Phil Carber and his analysis of the underground racetrack uh, arrays beneath Chinese cities built for Chinese strategic ballistic missile tells, I mean, there's, there's way m more concrete than 300 nuclear weapons would indicate. So, um, what to do in this new context where Vladimir Putin is not only talking about nuclear weapons, he's moving them around, he's sending them to Belarus, he's posturing, he's threatening, and we don't have tactical nuclear weapons with which to respond. Um, our concentration on these issues has become rhetorical and political rather than operational. So what should we do? What has happened in the past? Why is this so important? Well, during the Cold War, tactical nuclear weapons were very much part of the nuclear equation, both at sea and from the sea to the shore. So at the end of the Cold War, Marshal Akramayev came to Washington to visit his American counterpart, our chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral uh, Bill Crow. And he presented Admiral Crow with what has come to be known as Akramayev's map. And this was a depiction from the Soviet perspective of what we had done to the Soviet Union. We had surrounded the Soviet Union with nuclear firepower. Uh, not least from ships at sea. So remember that Navy tactical nuclear weapons were not just for, they were in part, but not just for uh, war fighting at sea against naval targets, but also aimed at targets ashore, both with aircraft and cruise missiles. Now I'm talking about tactical nuclear weapons. I was a P3 nuclear weapons delivery pilot, for instance, and and anybody of an age remembers what it was like to have nuclear weapons aboard their ship or in their squadron and, and all the things we had to do to, to get through that. Akramayev's map is a dim memory. You can read about it in John Lehman's book, Oceans Ventured. Uh, he tells the story and even has some pictures to go with it. But it's sort of, um, it's the story of forgetting because Akramayev's map literally, physically has been forgotten, but the lessons of Akramayev's map have been forgotten as well. During the Cold War, these weapons changed the entire complex and complexion, excuse me, changed the entire complexion of the US fleet. Surface ships in particular, but Navy aviation squadrons as well, became part of the solution of the firepower solution vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Destroyers and cruisers with 
tactical nuclear weapons were a very, very different uh, animal to be dealt with by the Soviets. Um, the, those ships were now not just air defense ships, but they were part of the firepower equation. This was all in the Cold War nuclear context. It was very specific. It was part of life. It was part of the air we breathed. And it was sort of a natural act. Um, but now, that's not the case. Um, the, this has become very politicized. And the Navy has turned its back on the whole context. So the Navy doesn't want to do this. Um, What's the, what's the historical precedent for the Navy doing something that it doesn't want to do, or couldn't do, or wasn't allowed to do? And the, and the example I use in my article is the example of unrestricted submarine warfare. If you haven't had a chance to read Execute Against Japan by Joel Holwit, please do that, because it's the story of your counterpart institution, the Naval War College, and its effect on Navy um, operational planning in the 1930s, when it was literally illegal uh, in international law to conduct unrestricted submarine warfare. That was, that was an after effort of the first Battle of the Atlantic during the First World War. It was outlawed. So it was outlawed to do it. But somewhere along the line, the Navy said, well, it's not against the law to think about it. And so what happened was the Naval War College, which at that time was part of OPNAV rather than a sort of a separate educational institution, as is starting to sound familiar, was able to derive through wargaming and analysis unrestricted submarine warfare solutions for the Navy, which became not only the Navy's operational approach, but it became the national strategic approach to World War II, which was to starve out Germany and Japan. And the war in the Pacific is a complete reprise of that thinking and pre-war planning. Now, on December 7th, uh, Admiral Stark, then the CNO, picked up the phone and said to President Roosevelt, only one side of this conversation was, record was written down for posterity, said, well, Mr. President, you know that thing we were talking about, about unrestricted submarine warfare? I'm going to send out the message this afternoon. So that's where it was on December 7th. And the rest, as they say, is history. So my sense is, just for general consumption, that the Naval Postgraduate School is now in a position where it can do the same kind of analysis and thinking through operational and technical alternatives uh, at times when they are either not accepted or they're, they're very, very unpalatable. Tactical nuclear weapons is a perfect example of the opportunity space that exists for you. So um, as I said, I don't want to, I don't want to go through every part of this, but um, let me make a couple of points. The first is that the article mentions, but is not only about um, Slickum N, the nuclear sea-launched cruise missile, number one. Number two, it's definitely not only about Slickum N in submarines. The idea is that this proliferation would go throughout the fleet. Okay. Um, a, a key component of my thinking has been formed, as you might expect, um, by my experiences as a serving naval officer. I was the U.S.-Japan Alliance manager for five years, and I'm very attuned to what the, the political and strategic winds blowing from Tokyo. And the Japanese and their Co South Korean cousins are asking us very explicitly as explicitly as their systems will allow to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons into Northeast Asia, ashore in their countries, or aboard our ships that go in and out of their ports. This is very, very different. 
But they have the same point that Admiral Charles Richard made when he talked about an escalation and deterrence gap because of our lack of tactical nuclear weapons. It has gotten to the point where Tokyo is, is convincing itself that the US, not only will it not defend Japan with tactical nuclear weapons, but that as part of that conclusion that the US Navy cannot get forward and will not stay forward. So this is all of a piece. So the, the stakes in tactical nuclear weapons from the perspectives of our allies in uh, not just Asia, but Europe as well, are very much part of this equation. Now, we don't have to do what our allies say. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, it makes sense to listen to what they're saying and why they're saying it. Now, the security of uh, Ukraine, lest I say it again, and Japan and South Korea are dependent upon extended, tact, uh, extended nuclear uh, guarantees, okay? And this has been an opportunity cost for them, and so as a result, they have not developed nuclear weapons programs themselves. But if you look at the footnotes in the article, please pay attention to the footnotes in the so-called sidebar, which was basically half of the article that was put into a sidebar. Um, my Japanese colleagues reminded me that this notion that it would take Japan a month to develop nuclear weapons is ridiculous. This retired, very, very senior Japanese diplomat said it would take at least six weeks. All right? Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, the Japanese have, f have established a, um, a f uh, uh, commission. This is how Japan does things. When it's trying to sort out difficult things or it's trying to tell us difficult things about our security relationship. They've established this commission headed by uh, General Horiki, who, used, who was the equivalent of our chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He's been retired for about 10 years, but he's been called to head this commission. And this commission has said, bring nuclear weapons into Japan. Now this is a huge sea change on the part of Tokyo and Japan. And the same kinds of things are going on in South Korea. Um, we've, in the past two months, we've sent three nuclear, pro nuclear propelled uh, submarines to South Korea for port calls. One of them was an SSN, one was an SSGN, and this is really unprecedented, one was an SSBN. But the fact of the matter is that South Korea has had a covert nuclear weapons program and Japan can have one. And so the issue for us going forward is whether we want to have nuclear proliferation with American characteristics in places like Northeast Asia or whether we want to coexist uneasily with nuclear proliferated states in places like Northeast Asia. So this is, you know, these are kind of two uh, very different outcomes, but they both involve more, I should say, they both involve the introduction, the reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons. Now, just one final point. I, I, I think I've said it, but I want to make sure I said it loud and clear. This is not just about war at sea. It can be about war at sea, but it's not just and never was just about war at sea. So during the Cold War, tactical nuclear weapons in the war at sea context were because our sensors and our weapons were so bad that if you really, really had to destroy a target like a, a, a Soviet SSBN, for instance, you were going to use a tactical nuclear weapon to, to bridge the gap in your sensor capabilities and your weapons capabilities. However, at the same time, and I'm um, not only recalling this, but I am proposing it, at the same time, it's land attack nuclear weapons from the fleet. 
this is one of, it's not the only, but this is one of the aspects of a maritime strategy that would make sense, in my view, when we shift from counterproliferation to firepower. Because we are back in that previous circumstance of great power competition against nuclear armed powers in the context of allies and friends and also other opponents who are looking very carefully about how we're approaching this subject. My sense is let's, we have to do this whether we want to or not. And let me underscore, we do not want to do this. That's why I use the example of unrestricted undersea warfare in the World War II context, prior to World War II. This is the time for you and this organization, this institution here, and you individually to think this through. I don't think I have all the answers. I can't possibly put all the issues on the table, but I want this to be, and I hope it will be, the beginning of a conversation with you and NPS about tactical nuclear weapons at sea. So I probably said more than enough, so let's shift now into the best part of the whole thing, which will, I hope will be your questions both online and here in the room. <laughs> well, thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful presentation. There's also a podcast, if you don't want to read the article on the uh, proceedings uh, website. Right. Right. It's very, very interesting. Um, you know, it, prior to the talk, Paul and I talked about our past life is in the Navy, me as an assistant professor at NPS, and we, we hearken back to 1991. So 30, about 32 years ago next month, uh, George H.W. Bush uh, issued a set of presidential nuclear initiatives, and that's where he uh, unil unilaterally, without reciprocation from the Soviets, took, uh, or the Russians by then, took nuclear weapons off, tactical nuclear weapons, out of the Navy. And it came as a shock to op, uh, to, to OpNav, to my buddies at Op 65. Op 65 was the shop that did tactical nuclear weapons inside the Pentagon. So obviously these guys were being put out of, out of business. And Bush did this without consulting the bureaucracy. One day he just simply announced it, was right. the way the story was told. So, Not a surprise. Well, and if it was a surprise, a surprise to these people too. But it, I guess the, the, the story they told is that it also surprised the CNO, who was Admiral Kelso at the time. And when Kelso heard about this, he turned to his staff and said, rip it out, rip it all out, rip it out so they can never put it back in. Right? Think about that. So my p question to Paul is, why did he say that? <laughs> because tactical nuclear weapons were a pain in the butt. You had all kinds of surety and guarantee programs. You had special alarm systems. You had security roving patrols. You had uh, contingencies. You had the possibility, in fact, sometimes the, the actuality of nuclear weapons art accidents. Broken arrow, broken arrow was the code word for a nuclear weapons accident. Um, one in, in my research, I did a Federation of American Scientists. I, I extracted a Fer Federation of American Scientists 20-page uh, essay on all of the problems and all of the accidents and all of the potential for miscues. Well, that's part of the, pr of the price of doing business. The same thing can go for a 45 if you don't know what you're doing. But uh, yeah, it was so unpopular and still is. So again, this is why the issue of uh, unrestricted submarine warfare at the end of the interwar period is so instructive because how do you get the Navy to change its mind? Because that's what it's going to take, obviously. Any questions? Yes, go ahead, please. You okay, Wait, do you want to come up to the microphone so they can hear you at home? Thanks. So I can reach out and <laughs> sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Vanderpool, Operations Research uh, here at NPS, SWO in a past life. Um, there's been an increased politic politicization and attention from Congress and the civilians in terms of naval force design, weapons procurement acquisition, you know, F-35 program getting a lot of media attention. With this increased emphasis also on precision, accuracy, long-range, super precise strike missiles, 
do you do you think there is a civilian appetite for something like tactical nukes? And if there's not, how can you see the Navy with the increased pressure from Congress to like slim down or find more efficient ways? How can the Navy push that train forward without essentially upsetting the the money keepers? I'm really glad you brought this up. This is a key question. Could we do this without tactical nuclear weapons? So uh, in the Cold War, you couldn't get close enough, for the most part, to have an effect on a target. You had to have, um, in some cases, very, very large thermonuclear weapons, uh, but in other cases, smaller, but still pretty hefty nuclear weapons. As the character of war has changed and precision has increased, one wonders. And I don't, I don't have clearance now, so I don't know whether uh, non-nuclear precision weapons can have the same effect. I am willing to be surprised and accept that that might be the case. But it reminds me of the Dr. Strangelove vignette where the American president is excoriating the Russia, his Russian counterpart. Well, talking about their doomsday machine that's now going to end the world as we know it. I said, well, Sergei, when you developed this weapon, you were supposed to tell us so that it would have the desired effect and everybody would understand what the new um, operational and strategic circumstances were. So if, in fact, this capability exists, uh, the Navy or DOD is going to have to tell us Otherwise, we're just going to continue to be free to speculate and assume that it doesn't. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for keeping secrets, don't get me wrong. But uh, this, and as I said, I'm hoping that my article will be the beginning of a conversation. So that's going to be part of the conversation. No, we got it. We can do this without nuclear weapons. Well, don't tell me. Tell the Japanese and the South Koreans to start. Thank you. Come on, come on down. <coughs> the next question is? Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Dan Smart, also SWO. So when it, in your experience as a uh, P3 on a P3 with nuclear weapons, was the operational use, you know, if the war starts, use it as you need it, or was it going to be a very tightly controlled, uh, you know, the president needs to call your airplane to say you can use this nuclear weapon? Very tightly controlled. I, I practiced answering or responding to emergency action messages, which is what you're talking about all the time. Thanks, sir. And for those of you who don't know the history of civilian control, which is what the lieutenant was talking about, uh, of nuclear weapons, the, the Pentagon is basically a museum. It's a five-sided museum. And there, there are um, exhibits all over the place and tucked underneath I think the river entrance stairway from the entry lobby was a display case with the correspondence with the marginal uh, notation the correspondence was from Leslie Groves reporting on how many tech how many nuclear weapons would be available for use against Japan subsequent to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in pencil in the margin in the hand of George Marshall was the comment additional weapons are not to be uh, utilized without the express permission of the president or words to that effect. So that was the first instance of what you were talking about, this very tightly controlled uh, command and control of nuclear weapons. Got a question online. Um, so in your view, how might employment of tactical nuclear weapons on all our combatants change the targeting calculus for our potential adversaries? Let's take China, for instance. China's going to try to sink you or shoot you down no matter what. So uh, it's, not, it's, it's a very interesting and good question. Uh, I think one of the objections in the comment and discussion column coming up in the next issue of proceedings will be, well, you know, you'll, we'll be back to the to the bad old days of I can neither confirm nor deny and I won't let your ship into my port uh, in New Zealand, in Japan, and other places around the world. So that, 
that's going to be a, an issue also. But um, I, I don't think that it's going to work against us. In for a penny, in for a pound in that context. Sure, come on down. Hey, I'm Don Barber from Double E, so I don't understand how this political stuff works. Um, my question to you then is, I, I think first off, it's a great idea that people study this and look through it. Execute in Japan is a fantastic book. Rules of the Game is also a fantastic book, and people get complacent. It sounds like your argument is the Russians have threatened to do something reprehensible, so we need to be prepared to also do something reprehensible, which doesn't seem like the set of values as a nation we would normally want to espouse. I think if tactical nuclear weapons were employed in limited quantities in Ukraine, we can roll over the Russians with the forces that we have or the strategic nuclear weapons that we have. I don't know that small nuclear weapon is the right, mm -hmm. it allows an escalation path, but I don't see that escalation path ending. And we give up some moral high ground to say that we're gonna be forward and ready to nuke you because you threatened to do it to us? Thank you. Good. That's a great question. So first of all, this is not my thought originally. I discovered, although I was thinking it, uh, I discovered the thinking and speaking of Admiral uh, Charles Richard, who at the time was the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command. And he said, we have this escalation and deterrence gap that it makes it more difficult in a nuclear context because you don't have anything but strategic, that is to say much larger weapons with which to respond. I think that's right. Um, I, I know that our allies think that way too. And so this puts the mark right on this whole issue of, well, do we have to fill this gap somehow and why and so on. Again, start of a conversation, but the, the, the nuclear weapons theory, not the physics of it, but the, the employment of it is pretty straightforward. That's one thing. That's a big thing, but it's one thing. The other thing is the United States has never forsworn first use of nuclear weapons, ever. So it's not as if we would be moving into a new conceptual or moral space thereby if we were to, to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons. Now, you know, this is the kind of stuff that makes me want to go to church beca because um, I'm, I hope I'm not promoting the idea of the end of the world, but rather the idea that in order to deter effectively, you have to have tactical nuclear weapons in your armory so that the likelihood of using them, you know, and again, how do you, how do you adjudicate this likelihood, but is greater, therefore it's more reasonable to expect that the U.S. would respond if it had tactical nuclear weapons. That should, according, again, according to this calculus, that should um, reassure our allies and worry our enemies. That's the whole point. That's, this is the part of the deterrent equation. So that's, thank you. That, that's a great question though. Paul, just to follow up on that. So one mission that you would see for tactical nuclear weapons at sea would be deter, one is to deter nuclear attacks upon US Navy at sea, to, to, to deter that. The second, you could say, another mission could be to, to bolster the secure second strike force. You know, if you put slick them in on tactical summary on uh, SSNs, uh, they're relatively, you know, they could hide, you could deliberately hide them. So you could build, bolster that second strike capability. And even a third mission would be to have sort of a residual force that, in, in God forbid, there was actually a nuclear exchange. These could be weapons that would continue a, nu a U.S. nuclear capability on indefinitely in the future. What do you think about that range of, of, of missions? I'm reminded of Herman Kahn's thinking the unthinkable. Uh, I am more, I, I will be perfectly frank with you, I am more comfortable with thinking about the deterrent aspects of this than the war fighting aspects of this, um, be that as it may. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to dodge the question. No, no, but, uh, 
Uh, we have a thoughtful question from Lieutenant Kim from the South Korean Army uh, online. Uh, he, uh, his, his first question was, um, first he fully supports the idea, uh, as you express South Korea uh, does, uh, but he counters skepticism that no country will use tactical nuclear weapons, even if they possess it, since it will lead to full scale uh, of nuclear war. In a way, you've addressed this, and, uh, but his second question, you can address that, but I also would like to read his second question. How do you think about reinforcing the Allies' potential capabilities of tactical nuclear weapons? South Korea has technologies and capabilities to make nuclear weapons in a short period, but the only limitation is the ROK-US Atomic Agreement that prohibits the reprocessing of nuclear fuel. I think it would be helpful to strengthen the deterrence against China and North Korea's nuclear threat in North East Asia. I want to hear your opinion about these two questions. Uh, I've thought a fair amount about the second question, and I'll ask you to repeat the first question here in a minute. Um, I think we, as the United States, have three alternatives. Um, the first alternative is to do this on our own. Everybody is reassured we have American nuclear weapons wherever they need to be in whatever category and so on is required. Um, and we don't right now. That's the point of George H.W. Bush's uh, withdrawal of tacti tactical nuclear weapons from our arsenals, for the most part. The second is to have, and this is an existing example both from the Cold War but also persisting, or continuing I should say, I don't want to give it that bad connotation of persistence, of dual key, dual control, nuclear weapons with allies. That's what happens now in Europe. There are about a hundred or so gravity bombs, B-61 gravity bombs in Europe uh, with dual control with our allies. That's the second alternative. And that would, in, in the case of Lieutenant Kim's question, that would mean that our al allies either have nuclear weapons provided by us or they have their own and we share command and control and so on. And certainly in the South Korean context, shared command and control applies to the entire US ROK alliance. Uh, and the third, as I mentioned, is the third alternative, which I think is very unpalatable, um, is that we have to coexist with very independent a multitude of very independent nuclear weapon states in various parts of the world. Um, I, I just want to, I just want to point out that, that it's not me who's saying this or making us think about these things. It's Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping who are making us think about these things. I would prefer that we go on the way things have gone. And we don't have to worry about this. But you know, we're, we're confronted by this, and it's my sense is that it's our moral and operational, and by the way, constitutional uh, responsibilities to deal with these issues. Now, I don't mean that you have to do what I say. What I mean is you have to start by talking about it and thinking about it, and that's, of course, w the, so, sort of the whole premise of what I'm trying to get at. It, is it, uh, I'm sorry, his first question was this. He runs into skeptics that say this, that no country can use tactical nuclear weapons, even if they possess it, since it will lead to full-scale uh, nuclear warfare. And how do you address this skepticism? Well, um, that thinking turns on its head the realities of the Cold War, because the fear was not that people wouldn't, if you will, uh, use nuclear weapons, but that they would. Uh, President Eisenhower, sort of the progenitor, after the initial Truman handling of these issues, of the, the escalation and distribution of tactical nuclear weapons, because he did not want a large army. And so he said, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll just replace manpower with tactical nuclear weapons. So that we'll let the Soviets maintain the Red Army 
in its masses, and we won't. We'll withdraw most. We'll we'll bulwark. We'll bolster. We'll bolster NATO, and we'll use tactical nuclear weapons. Nobody knew, and and Eisenhower went to his grave without letting anyone know whether or not he would authorize the use of nuclear weapons, tactical or strategic. And he said the whole game is to not let anybody know, but the presumption is that you would. So I, unfortunately, we have to get back to the presumption that we would, as unpalatable and as, as discordant as that seems, because what's unpalatable and discordant in the first place? The return of the curse, uh, the specter of great power competition. That's what that means, that we're back in the soup with the Chinese and the Russians. That, I mean, this is, we're, all, we're past worrying about the niceties of this and whether we can somehow smooth it out or, or round out the, the rough edges. It, it, unfortunately, we're, we're sort of back to the future in that regard. My sense. Don Brutzman, Undersea Warfare. Sir, thank you first for your opening this hardest of all topics, perhaps, very clearly. Uh, two questions, please. First. It seems as if tactical nuclear weapons rarely distinguish between detonation on the land and detonation under the ocean surface or detonation in the atmosphere. I mean, it, it seems as if there might be plausible deniability for an opponent. Uh, there's no immediate fear of nuclear winter. The effects are not visible, even though they could be long term. Uh, do you see this as part of the calculus anywhere that an opponent might take advantage of the difference in the undersea environment compared to other places where weapons might be employed? Do you mind if I answer that before you ask the second one? Please. Yes, um, sure. This was one of the great imponderables through the Cold War was can you separate out tactical nuclear weapons ashore from strategic nuclear weapons ashore and can you separate out nuclear weapons at sea from nuclear weapons ashore and so nobody knew and we wrestled with this pro problem others I, when I say we the US and allies wrestled with this problem and I don't think there was I could be wrong so some of you may know more about this than I do. The odds are that somebody in this room does. Uh, but that was never um, resolved. And that I think it's still unresolved. Certainly you couldn't hide, as an example, you couldn't hide the ex uh, nuclear explosion at sea. You, you just can't do it. I mean, there's too much sensing going on. Uh, you, you're not going to go out with four nuclear weapons and come back into port with three and you know it, it's just not going to happen that way so i think it's still unresolved i don't think there's any solace in trying to separate them out if, uh, not that you were get, getting at that but that's my answer building on those thoughts uh the national defense strategy nuclear policy review nuclear posture review uh, we have strategic deterrence at one end we have conventional warfare on the other we have uh, a slippery slope. Where is, where is tactical nuclear on that? But we also have uh, relatively fresh guidelines regarding uh, integrated deterrence. And any thoughts on integrated deterrence and uh, quote unquote tactical nuclear weapons? Are they part of what we are deterring? Are they part of maybe a, a graded solution? Uh, do we really even know what we're dealing with yet? <clears throat> this gets at the earlier question. I don't remember which of you asked it about whether there were non-nuclear alternatives, right? So 
I personally would be hard pressed to figure out where in a sort of neat continuum nuclear weapons fit in this whole architecture of from strategic nuclear to conventional warfare. Uh, I don't think it's a neat continuum. That's the first thing. Um, and I welcome, because again, sometimes truth has to be told about whether there are alternatives. I mean, I would be happy to accept the disclosure that, uh, that viable alternatives exist so that we can figure out then how to think about these tactical nuclear weapons. I mean, I think that would be a, a great thing, if it's, it's true. But I don't know that it's true. And my sense is that we would all know it if it were true. Because the weapons manufacturers, the New York Times, and the Pentagon would have told us by now that, don't worry, we can do this without nuclear weapons. I don't think that's what integrated deterrence means. Integrated deterrence, as I read it, as I was reviewing for the article and, and just before this talk, is that integrated deterrence means you're going to use all means of national power. Then there's the other integrated deterrence that integrates conventional and nuclear. And so um, f first there's a terminology problem. And second, uh, the documents that I looked at do not answer any of these questions. Paul, just to follow up on the point you made about Eisenhower, when Eisenhower said that, you know, or you said about Eisenhower that there's an assumption that if I attack you with nuclear weapons and you have nuclear weapons, you'll sh shoot back with the nuclear weapons, right? So the, there's an ex uh, assumption, there's an expectation that they will be used under certain circumstances. Well, if you don't have nuclear weapons, then there's no expectation, right? Can you get away with it? Sh you know, now, now what does the U.S. do at a tactical level? The only option you have is to shoot back with strategic nuclear weapons, which are larger, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, so, th so is that the gap we, we, we really need to fill at sea? Not that we're, we're sort of begging for it, asking for it. So there's something else going on in my mind that I want to use Professor Wurtz's question to get at, <clears throat> which is that um, before I went to the SEC DEF's office and worked on Japan issues, um, I worked in the Navy's strategy office in OPNAV, in what was then OP 603, and is now N7 to something or other. And it was the Maritime Strategy Office. And there the issue had been, because this was in the aftermath of the famous mid-1980s Maritime Strategy, what the Navy's for, uh, how are you going to use it, and what you need, and so on. Um, so I've kind of inculcated that aspirational thinking. OK, how do we make? We got this Navy thing going on here. How do we use the Navy? What is the benefit to the US of American naval power, as, as opposed to maritime power, which is kind of the same but different? And remember what I said about firepower. And so one way to use the Navy that we have is to employ this kind of nuclear firepower again, which would have, my view, and for all the right reasons, a transformative effect on American naval power. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to say that I'm backing into this issue because of my sense of, of American naval power and maritime strategy, but that would be one of the end results which would be a good thing. I don't know if I answered the question at all. Our online audi audience is now waking up uh, with all kinds of questions. So uh -oh. one thing I'd like to remind everyone, both here and online, uh, is that if we don't address your comments or your questions in this seminar, 
Uh, you can always put them in USNA proceedings comments in response to Paul's article, and there's a live uh, comments in return from that as well. Is that Bill Hamlet saying that? No, no, Bill's not on here, but <laughs> but I, well, his, I'm providing his, his commercial his, for him. His paid agent. Uh, let's start off. This is from Lieutenant, Can, uh, Let Lieutenant Commander Massengale. Uh, given the Department of Energy's capability to either refurbish uh, or build new nuclear weapons is nearly maxed out at least several years to get a new tactical nuclear weapon, is the need for Navy naval tactical nukes so great that we should start considering submarine launch ballistic missiles for tactical or targets? Well, that's already happened and, and uh, much s smaller than the typical uh, thermonuclear weapons have been fitted on ballistic missiles in Navy SSBNs. Th there's a problem with that because then how does, how can you, can you differentiate, is that an issue, is that a problem between a big missile coming at you, and what kind of warhead does it have? Is it a conventional warhead, is it a tactical or strategic, so-called strategic warhead? Uh, but that's already happened and I, I think I think it's a B-61, but I'm not sure. Okay, this is from Mr. Mark Dankel, one of our faculty associates. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hello, my name is Cynthia Irvin, Computer Science. Um, back in the old days of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, they were largely analog and manual, and people created huge bulkheads between the world of, of cyber. Uh, but now, um, cyber is involved in everything. We now have a new warfare domain, um, cyberspace, etc. cetera. Uh, in um, the world of analog manual um, manipulation of the systems, um, there was a certain amount of friction that limited the size and complexity. In cyberspace, complexity is just infinite. You can keep writing software forever and nothing goes wrong with it. Well, everything can go wrong with it, but you can just keep writing it. So um, my question is that given this additional complexity and the um, illustrations that have taken place, for example, at Natanz with Stuxnet, um, do we dare uh, hook our strategic um, or, or tactical nuclear weapons with uh, cyber assets uh, and do command and control of those uh, across cyberspace uh, when our adversaries will probably be able to wheel in. I don't know. Um, I think what that illustrates is that we've got a bigger problem on our hands and that we can't separate out nuclear weapons or many other issues from the issue of cyber defense and offense. Uh, I. I, th I think you make a good point. I'm not sure you're going to get this one back, but tell me when we have another question <laughs> behind us. Uh, this question is from Mr. Mark Dankel um, uh, online. He says, how do you envision a tactical or nuclear doctrine of use evolving in the military given the hyper-politicized climate that describes our elected leadership? None of, nothing that I have thought about or written about is apolitical. It's, this is ultimately, nuclear weapons are ultimately a political act. So, you know, if, if our political system is not capable of dealing with the command and control of nuclear weapons, which is, I, which is what I take as the point of the question, then we've got, like with cyber, then we've got bigger problems on our hands, and I think we have a lot of problems on our hands. But I don't mean that a, as a partisan political perspective, but if nothing else, we haven't had to think about this for a very long time. Now we have to think about it again. Um, the military aide to the president right now is sitting with the, the suitcase that is used to um, launch nuclear, to send the, the, the orders to launch nuclear weapons. Um, 
So the reality hasn't changed much, but the politics has because we've kind of backed away from all of this. So just as there are physical infrastructure issues with reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons or any other kind of weapon that has a mass effect, cyber being a perfect example of that, you have to develop the, the political protocols to deal with those issues. Now, I guess, I, I don't want to speculate, but it would seem to me that if, if we can't do that, then maybe we need to be, cha maybe we need to change the subject to something more fundamental than, than an operational weapon. Another is this, uh, Chuck Gill would like to know, uh, given our budgetary constraints, what capabilities should we give up to offset the cost of developing, manning, and maintaining tactical nuclear weapons? So am I the only person in America who thinks that despite the huge amount of money that we're spending on defense that we're either not spending it properly or we're not spending enough? So one of the arguments against tactical nuclear weapons is that, well, apart from them being unpopular and difficult to handle and so on, is that, well, they'll take up space in uh, torpedo rooms or in VLS cells and so on. Okay, well then get more torpedo rooms and get more VLS launchers. In other words, build a bigger Navy. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's necessary or to, and I'm not sure that the questioner is saying this, but I, I think it's not necessary to say, well, what do you have to, if you want this, what do you have to give up? This is, after all, I, I keep coming back to this, so I hope you bear with me. This is great power competition. It's like you're playing high school football and there's this tackle who's gonna tear your head off. Now what do you do? You have to figure out how to run faster, cut quicker, throw longer, and so on. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it, it's, a, it's back to uh, a, new, a, a new old reality that has to be dealt with. Well, the follow-on question and sort of addresses that, so I'd like to read it. It's by uh, Warren Vanneman. He said, thank you for the thought-provoking presentation. During the Cold War, most Americans knew what was at stake. During the 1950s and 60s, there were public service announcements warning of nuclear war. In 1962, we had a blockade to prevent the Soviets from placing nuclear weapons in Cuba. During the Reagan administration, Europeans protested the deployment of nuclear weapons on their continent. Over the decades, the American public has forgotten these lessons of the Cold War. Now a Cold War-like environment exists with Russia and China. How does the United States get its political, and perhaps some military leaders, the citizens and citizenries to support the strategic posturing with nuclear weapons? Well, that's a good question, um, because I think the the jury is out and the issue is in doubt regarding acceptance of the fact that I clearly accept that the, of the realities of great power competition. Um, very senior DOD officials have rejected the premise that we are in a new Cold War with everything that that implies. And uh, again, this is not a political statement, it's that the people responsible literally for the national defense strategy aren't there yet. And so this is not, this issue of tactical nuclear weapons is part of a panoply of issues. It's not just something that we simply pluck from, from, from the tree. It's all connected and it's, it's moving forward against, against the grain. Um, we are not the first society that would not want to accept these realities. France in the 1930s is a perfect example of that. So is England, and so, by the way, are we. So uh, right up until December of 1941, American college students and, uh, and others elsewhere were signing petitions declaring that they would never serve in the US military to defend the United States. And then, 
just like that on December 7th, everything changed. I don't see, I don't want to say that's an easy out because, you know, the consequences were terrible, but I don't see us in that situation now. So, that, so then how do you build that awareness or consensus that over time? Right now, nobody is speaking truth to political power. That is to say, to the public political power about this. And uh, my sense is that, that uh, Washington is not in a good position to deal with this. This is one of the reasons why the analytical and technical ideas and thinking and alternatives that could come from here to enter <coughs> into that conversation there is so important. And if you think you can't do that, let me tell you something different. Do you have, do you have one of these? I bet you do. So just because nobody said that you had to do it doesn't mean you can't. Okay, so this brings me back to a lesson of the maritime strategy and the debacle of Goldwater Nichols, which assigned responsibility for strategic thinking to others. Just because Goldwater Nichols says the chairman shall, or the co regional combatant commanders shall do certain things, doesn't mean that the Navy or students at the Naval Postgraduate School, faculty, staff, and so on, shouldn't be adding their voices to this. Captain Chernipus asks this question. Um, Concur that we need to restore TAC nukes to fill a missing credible flexible response capability and to gain the added diplomatic impact of conspicuously raising the stakes in the minds of our adversaries' reds. Question one, will the U.S. restoring TAC nukes preclude allies from developing their own capabilities? And is there a sensible deterrent value to allies adding their own tactical nuclear capabilities to the mix, considering that we cannot guarantee how allies might use or release them? Uh, I'll ask you to repeat the second part of that okay. in a minute. <clears throat> but as far as the first part of the question goes, I think it's too late. I think that the issue of just, I could be wrong about this, but just U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons, tactical and or strategic I think the horse is out of the barn. I, I went back into some old emails, and this one particular email was from a, a, an American expatriate friend of mine from Tokyo from 2006, I think. It's so almost 20 years ago. And he said, you know, and, and Paul, we've really got to work on this nuclear guarantee issue. So we haven't been thinking about it but our allies have all of that time and now a, a very very senior friend of mine in Tokyo in a, in this is one of the footnotes in my article recounted how this, this, um, this lack of faith on the part of the US and the lack of the capability of the, on the part of the U.S. is common knowledge and talked about on the nightly news shows in Tokyo all the time. All the time. He's, the, his words, not mine. It, so, uh, so my sense is that they probably have these tacit programs already. The related question to that, is there sensible deterrent value uh, to allies adding their own tactical nuclear capabilities to the mix considering that we cannot guarantee how allies may use or release them. Well, this is why I, I, would, I would propose and suggest that closely coordinated command and control is probably the way to proceed here. Uh, that that was the third alternative, in, or the, in, in my article, the second alternative, which is either we do one and two, or we're gonna be stuck with three. One and two being our own we weapons or collaborative programs, or number three, this uncomfortable, uneasy presence with other allied friend or not, uh, 
national capabilities. Jim, do you, I know you have some questions. I'll pass it back to you. We still have some more online. You know, Paul, when I, uh, in preparing for this, uh, I read your article. And uh, one of the points you made is that the, an issue we all face is that the audience here has no experience with, with really any of this, with any sort of ideas about nuclear deterrence, the weapons, uh, the strategy behind all of it. This is all sort of new, and it's, it's really new. You know, I don't think they've been thinking about it much. Uh, so what I did is uh, I went back in, in, the, in the archives, right, and I went and found an article entitled Theater Nuclear Warfare and the U.S. Navy, and it was um, written by Lieutenant Commander Wood Parker, and he won some prize at the Naval War College, and it was published in January of 1982, right? And it was very interesting because he had three as a few assumptions here uh, about nuclear war at sea in the 1980s, early 1980s. So he's got three of them. And he said, the U.S. Navy does not believe that a tactical nuclear war at sea is likely. This attitude stems from three basic, if fairly muddled, assumptions. Okay, the first one, nuclear war at sea will follow, not precede, the use of nuclear, nuclear weapons on land. What do you think? Is that, still, is that true today? I'm not sure if it was true then, but is it true today? Follow or proceed? It will follow, not proceed. Th that's the question? Yeah. It will follow. They'll use nukes on land first, then at sea. <coughs> well, that's a great question. Um, the, the, the strategic or the high-level operational circumstances are a little bit different mm -hmm. between 1982 and 2022 or three. Then the most likely place that the East and West would come together and in a military confrontation was at was ashore. That's not the case now. Now the most likely place that the U.S. and the in China or will come together is at sea. So it tends to shade the question. I don't think the circumstances are the same, and I think the answer is different. No, I agree with you. In fact, when I read that question, that the, the, the I've been thinking about this a while, is how much of our deterrence thinking is actually shaped by the Cold War experience in on along the inner German border. Not, it's, it's a land context, not a maritime context. And how different is that? So, the very, I agree. How about a second, second assumption? Once begun, nuclear war cannot be limited to the oceans. Thus, the fear of escalation will prevent the use of nuclear weapons at sea. What do you think? Uh, th this issue was addressed earlier, mm. and I think it's, I think it's unresolved. Okay. I think it's unresolved. I, I, the, I was not only did participating as a student in the Global War Game in 1983 change my life, then in a weak moment I volunteered to be the OPNAV Global War Game action officer when, when I was five or so years later. And Global never figured it out. I mean, because how do you figure it out? Now, based on some of the things I've been hearing here at NPS, the analytical tools available are at least a start toward perhaps answering that. But I, as I said, I think it's unresolved and it's, I don't mean to say it's unresolvable, but you can imagine the tremendous amount of thinking that have to go through. But Right around here someplace within a football throw, there's a water-cooled supercomputer. Okay, so, you know, a couple years ago, what's that thing you got there, right? And how it's changed everything in the computing power and so on. Not just the computing power of this phone, but the computing power and connectivity that it, that it brings to us. Okay, so if you could have, I don't know how much this thing costs, this water-cooled supercomputer, but it's about the size of, of Jeff Klein sitting there. And holy cow, so you ought to be able, that maybe is a start toward figuring this out. Maybe, maybe you can do that, or you can do that. I don't know. How about the, th the third assumption? 
No matter where it begins, if the war goes nuclear, the resulting destruction will render naval planning and operations insignificant. So this is part of the backstory of the 1980s, um, and there's a good chance of that. It, this is the backstory of the 1980s maritime strategy, which started in the 1970s, when Admiral Hayward uh, was passing through uh, 7th Fleet on the way to Pack Fleet, and he, as a junior flag officer, relatively junior, but certainly new, started to read the plans, and he objected. Among other things, he said, wait, why do we have to go nuclear the first afternoon? Aren't there non-nuclear alternatives? Hence the germ, which grew from a mustard seed into this thing, uh, of the maritime strategy, which was in many ways the conventional war fighting alternative to nuclear weapons. I'm all in favor of that. I think that was a great idea. It didn't remove nuclear weapons from the face of the earth by any means, but it certainly took a lot of the pressure off. And so if we can do that, as you know, the question has come up with precision uh, munitions, can, we, can that be an alternative to and a placeholder for what would otherwise have to be nuclear weapons? Let's see if that works. We, we have a, our colleague from the land of 1,000 impact points. 5,000. 5,000. Yeah, Colonel Peter Frank, Germany. Um, we are, seems to be we have currently an arms race and how to mitigate an arms race is always a, a good question and uh, one option of this might be to get an arms treaty or arms control treaty uh, and I would ask you maybe you have to add to your thoughts about nuclear um, strategic impact also more considerations about arms treaties. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is precisely the approach that uh, President Reagan took in the 1980s with Glickham and Pershing II. And uh, he said, okay, we're going to have to make a point with Moscow. And over the objections of many in Germany, here, England, and so on, uh, fielded the ground launch cruise missile and the Pershing II intermediate range ballistic missile. And as soon as the Soviets sort of got serious about talking, then uh, Ronald Reagan was able to get to his primary objective, which was exactly that, which is arms control. Let's get rid of these things. And so he made, uh, as an action forcing issue, arms control in the denouement of the Cold War and surprised the crap out of everybody when the Soviets said, okay, let's talk about this. And then thing, one thing led to another. So exactly, I, I am not proposing nuclear weapons for the sake, I know you know this, but I'm not proposing nuclear weapons for the sake of nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I would much rather take the Admiral Hayward approach. Let's, let's provide something that is non-nuclear and then we can kind of reduce the tension but sometimes when you have uh, hard-headed opponents that doesn't work at first or maybe it doesn't work at all so it, it's going to depend going forward how this plays out thank you very much and i hope i didn't misstate uh, i certainly wasn't trying to speak for you or anybody in germany because these are issues that are as central to your security as they are to anyone else's Paul, we have about uh, 10 more minutes left, but I do have a couple more questions. Well, I got five more minutes left. You got five more minutes <laughs> left, okay. No, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. Commander Peter Whips uh, uh, says this. He asks if this is an appropriate analogy to what you're talking about, or excuse me, a valid metaphor. I should use his words. After Nokal in 1890, uh, or 1980, excuse me, After Miami what? 1986, North Hollywood in 1997 shootouts, the lesson was finally learned to arm police with patrol rifles so they were not outgunned by gangsters. The CCP are gangsters. We don't have the luxury of two decades and three bloodlettings to learn. In 2003, no one living in a dangerous gang-infested neighborhood would trust their safety to frontline cops 
relatively sparse in number, walking around with just revolvers. In your view, is that a valid metaphor? Vladimir Putin is rattling the tactical nuclear weapon saber, and we don't have one. So I think it is probably a valid comparison. Uh, another one from, uh, uh, from our uh, South Korean officer, Kim, uh, which is an interesting thought. He said, uh, do you think that North Korea will attack on South Korea with tactical nuclear weapons? And here's his thought process. <coughs> In my thought, and I think concern for, this is my editorial comment, concerned by many South Koreans, is even though North Korea has comparatively small nuclear arsenal, it has strategic nuclear weapons that can reach the whole U.S. homeland now with the Hansong 18. So North Korea definitely can use tactical nuclear weapons to attack South Korea in the face of escalating situation on the Korean Peninsula, but threatening the United States with a strategic nuclear arsenal at the same time. So I'm paraphrasing his qu uh, question here. And essentially, we set up a checkmate situation where North Korea can use tactical nuclear weapons we have no equivalent response on the peninsula. They threaten us with strategic nuclear weapons. Our only response is strategic nuclear weapons without these tactical nuclear weapons capabilities. And uh, he's interested in this sense, how might tactical nuclear weapons in the U.S. Navy be used for South Korea in this situation? Obviously, our North Korea policy and strategies have failed completely. Um, and so I'll just leave that there. Uh, one cannot separate out, nor do I intend to, separate out tactical nuclear weapons from strategic nuclear weapons. And deterrence works in both directions. What I'm proposing is let's get back in the deterrence game. So there's, as I mentioned, or as came up earlier, this whole notion of integrated deterrence isn't the kind of deterrence that I grew up thinking about or am, just, or am proposing. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not against integrated deterrence as described uh, and developed in the national security and national defense strategies. Using all elements of national power is all well and good. In the meantime, you have the issue of nuclear weapons on the table not least North Korean nuclear weapons, especially North Korean nuclear weapons that can reach Monterey. Uh, and so th this is part of the ongoing failure that we have, to, we have to stop. We're in a hole, as Will Rogers, the famous political commentator said, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. But that's where we are here. So uh, I, I look forward to working closely with our Korean allies because like our German allies, they're really right in, a, right in the middle of it. But it's either work with them or not. Any last thoughts? Not a single lieutenant fell asleep. <laughs> I am amazed. Thank you very much. I appreciate well, let's, uh, let's thank our uh, speaker for this afternoon. A uh, couple more commercials as we close out. Uh, tomorrow at noon, Paul will be in Glasgow 286 to discuss the American Sea Power uh, Project and uh, the possibility and opportunity uh, for you to write and contribute and comment on this uh, important issue of strengthening our naval and maritime capabilities. Uh, with that, I want to close out. Thank you for attending the Na National Security uh, <laughs> Studies, excuse me, National, let's try this again, the Naval Warfare Studies Institute present Sea Power presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay.